So tonight's message is called, Warn Them From Me. Warn Them From Me. <laughs> I've had a really good day today. Matter of fact, I've had a blessed day. I came up here throughout the week. We've had a lot going on. I've had, obviously you guys, some of you are familiar. My, uh, my dad is currently in Oklahoma. His, his brother, my uncle, um, passed away um, this last week. We were out actually at, at Morro Bay. We get the call. His brother's got 11 hours left to live. That's what they're saying. So, um, and I said, Dad, I said, it might be the best thing to do is to go ahead and, uh, and come home. So about Tuesday, we wrapped everything up and hit the road, and we were back here. And so, praise the Lord. Um, keep my family in prayer, my dad and my grandparents, um, as they obviously go through this time. But the blessing is, is that my Uncle Hammer was a believer. So that's the blessing, right? So, quickly, if I share in that, in that place, in John chapter 11, starting in verse 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Right? That was Jesus' question. So, the reason why I've had a good day today is... I, I, so, last night we came down, obviously, we had a wonderful time here at, at a prayer service. We just got down on our face and sought the Lord. We had a good time of fellowship, good time of prayer. So, I had it in my mind. I was like, you know what? I want to get up here bright and early tomorrow morning. I want to come in here in the morning and just seek God, get on my face. And God allowed me to do that. So, I actually got here this morning and my family went up over there. A lot of them have spent some time actually over at the other, the other church building. I was just here just seeking God one-on-one. -on -one. And so I'm like, man, God, you gave me a dream. You've, you've led me. You've showed, shared with me what you want me to, sh to say to your people. And I'm sitting up here writing. I just started writing. I barely got through writing my dream. And I wa got up to go get a bottle of water from, from the kitchen. And as I went there, there was a man sitting outside by our door, just sitting down by the concrete with his back laid up next to it. Didn't look like he was doing so good, but the first thing that went through my mind was, I'm right in the middle of writing a message, so I need to get back up there, right? I don't have time to go out and start this process. But then it convicted me. I was like, man, my life is not about me. And the message itself is something that God provides. It's not my ability. It's not my writing. It's not my know-how or my wisdom or my understanding. It's God's. And so I went and grabbed the water, grabbed some... some um, some Fritos, and I walked outside, and the very first thing I said, hey man, and I just showed him my hands, I said, are you hungry, would you like something to drink? And at first he thought, I said, you gotta go, you gotta get up out of here, right? And I said, no man, you're okay, you're not doing anything wrong, you're okay. He's like, are you serious, man? He's like, are you kidding me? He says, man, I'm going through it, I'm going through such a hard time. And so, I'm sitting here, thinking to myself, like, man, God, like, okay, here we go, right? So I sit down on the pavement right next to him, and I said, what's going on, man? He said, what, who are you? Like, where are you from? I said, well, this is a church right here. He said, are you kidding me? He said, this is a church? I said, yeah. He said, nah, no, no, it's not a church. I said, yes, it is. He said, no, you don't understand. He said, I just got here from Alabama. And he said, and I slept outside next to that trash can across, the, across on the bluffs uh, last night. And he said, nah, I... See, I'm angry with God. I'm mad at God because of the things that have been happening in my life. And he said, but I told God sarcastically that if, he, if I just so happened to stumble into a church, then I'd believe that he's drawing me to himself. He said, there's no way that this is a church. This is not a church. I said, well, come inside, Aaron. Is that okay? Can you want to come inside? He walked in the door and he about lost it when he looked inside here and saw that it was a church. Because God was drawing him to himself. Right? God was drawing him. God brought him. And so as I'm sitting there, sitting with him and sharing with him, his heart was just broken before the Lord. He's like, man, I've just, I've been through a lot. He says, you know, as I sat out on the bluffs last night, he said, I sat at the edge of, of, this, of this, this bench. And he said, one step out, he said, I would have fallen off the bluffs and actually went down. He said, and I would have died. And he says, and I was ready. I just, and he's got... You know, Brother Patrick and I have actually talked before. Obviously, Brother Patrick at one time, you know, cut himself. And this man has got scars from here all the way down. So he's dealt with that, of wanting to cut himself and wanting to harm himself. 
And so he said, nah, man, just last night, he said, I was thinking about going over, sitting on that bench, and just taking a step off and just letting it all go. And he said, but something wouldn't let me leave here. He said, I was sitting on the other side of this building. And he said, but the guys at the car wash were giving me dirty looks because I was sitting here. So he said, I just moved. It looked like this thing has been vacant forever, like there's nothing going on here. So he said, I just sat down and I was actually going to get ready to go to sleep and just take some, get some rest. And he said, and you open it. And he said, the first thing I thought was, is that this homeless guy, because I was barefoot, he's like, this homeless guy is pretty cleaned up to be a homeless guy. And he says, but what is going on here? And I said, man, don't be deceived. I said, God is drawing you to himself. If you just got here from Alabama and you said, God, if you're real, if you're actually there, if I just so happen to stumble, that was his words, into a church, then I will know that you're drawing me. Little did he know he was sitting on the outside of a tiny hole in the wall little church in East Bakersfield. And God was drawing him to himself. So he brought him in, fed him, met with him, prayed with him. And I remember just sitting here at the front, front, front uh, chairs right here and just sharing with him. And trust me, guys, the time is just flying by, right? Five hours before service, four hours before service, and I'm sitting here. He says, man, I, I don't understand. Why would God die for somebody like me? Why would Jesus do what He did? I don't understand. I got to share with him why. I got to tell him all about God's motive why He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, and why Jesus did what He did, why He went to the cross, why He was buried, why He was risen from the grave, why He's coming back, and shared with Him my dream. And as we sat here today, God just blew Him away. And so it was beautiful. So I ended up getting, actually, um, there's a place He's staying at in Oil Dell. We met up with a friend, is able to stay down there, and uh, his name is Aaron. And uh, shortly after that, I'm like, okay, i got to get back. i got to get back up in there, keep writing this message, keep writing the sermon, because time is short. And, but I was just rejoicing in the Lord. I'm like, man, God, this is awesome. I've had such a good day because you brought him to me. You allowed me to share with him. My like, God, I'm up in here, right? Sister Lee and, and, or Brother Lee and Sister Lisa, they weren't out today out in the streets, right? And so I had a message to write anyway. Nonetheless, I'm like, man, God, because I know what my calling is. And you should know what your calling is too. It's to go out to the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature. So I couldn't be out in the streets and in the highways and the byways today. I couldn't be out in the gutters looking for somebody. So God brought him to the door. And I'm just like, wow, this is awesome, God, right? So I just stayed here, and he just brought him. And so when, when Aaron, when he went away and God just blessed him and just touched his heart, drew him to himself, all of a sudden I look across the way, and there's our dear brother Richard, who we haven't seen in like a month. <laughs> And Brother Richard's digging out of the trash can. And he's a mess. And he's got a woman's shirt on and it's all over the place. And I ran from here all the way across to the bluffs because I'm like, we cannot let this dude escape because he'll escape. And I got to him. I'm like, Richard, come on, man. Brought him in. The Lord blessed him, cleaned him all up. Brand new pair of shoes. He's looking fresh. And he came in and got to share a cup of coffee. We got to pray together, and I just sat in here, and honestly, I, I wept before the Lord. I cried right here. I said, God, I've had such a good day. This is so awesome. And then I get to share your word tonight to your people. So today has been a really good day. Today has been a blessed day. Amen? Amen. So tonight's message, again, is called, Warn Them From Me. In the book of Joel, chapter 2, starting in verse 28, it is written, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon my handmaids in those days will I pour out my Spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So the Lord Most High is alive and well. He, just like the days of the early church in Acts chapter 2, when Pentecost came, when God poured out His Spirit, He's still doing it today. He's still doing it upon His people. 
all upon His children. And there shall be prophecy, there shall be dreams, and there shall be visions from God Most High. God, even today, is showing us wonders in the heavens and in the earth. Listen to me. We must pay attention as the bride of Christ. Why? Because we shall not get complacent. Why? Because people get complacent. What does that mean? They get comfortable. They get set in their ways. Don't become like the man who says, Oh, my Lord is not coming in my generation. He begins to eat and to drink with the drunken. He begins to beat his maidservants, men's servants. And then it says, The Lord shall come upon him in a day when he is not looking for him. And he shall cut him in two and give him his portion with the unbelievers. We cannot get complacent, church. I did not come here today to preach health, wealth, and prosperity, and peace, and safety. That's not what I'm here to preach. I'm here to warn you from God. God's calling me to warn you. God's warning me. God is showing us signs and wonders in the heavens. I understand the ash that's floating right now that's covering all of our vehicles out there in the parking lot that you've seen today. That smell that you've seen, that burnt, right? We know it's from wildfires here in California. I get it. But listen, did you, not, did you forget that there's a day coming when God is going to burn the earth with fire? That the heavens will be burned with fire? That the earth will be made new? That the heavens will be made new? Do you know what that day is coming? Pay attention to what's going on out there. When you look at the sun and you can stare at it plainly, it looks like blood. Pay attention. Pay attention. They should be warnings. They should be signs for every single one of us to say, Hey, don't forget church. Don't get complacent church. Don't get too comfortable. You want to know how I know that there's things in your life and my life that we never get comfortable about? I know. How many of you lock your doors before you go to sleep at night? You do. And as a dad, what do we do? As a dad and as a husband, I, the whole parameter, the whole, everything, I'm checking every door, and then Darlene will come in and say, yeah, I already locked all the doors, I locked all the windows, and guess what? I go back and find some unlocked. I was like, that's exactly why I go behind and, and make sure, right? So what do I do? I'm preparing myself every single night for what? For an attack, for a thief, for a robber. So each night I'm preparing my household to give me just an inch of time, just a second more, to give me an opportunity to do what? To stand up and defend my household. Every one of you do it. You lock your doors at night. You make sure your windows are shut. You do everything that you need to do to make sure your house is secured against what? An attack in the middle of the night. But how many of us have gotten so complacent and comfortable when it comes to Christ? We're not watching anymore. We're not looking anymore. We're not checking the doors. We're not doing anything anymore. We're just going to church. We're getting our hour of religion. We're, we're reading our daily devotionals that takes five minutes. We're not spending any time in prayer. We're not reaching out to our neighbors. We're not reaching out to the lost. We're not doing anything because we've got complacent. Do that with your house. Leave your door wide open. Leave your windows open. Give everybody in the neighborhood an opportunity to come and take everything from you. That's what it's like right now. Our king is coming back. And people aren't ready. The judgment of God is upon the earth and it's only going to get worse. And people aren't ready. These are the signs of the times and the warning of His soon coming in the great terrible day of His wrath. As I reference in Joel chapter 2, it's also in Acts chapter 2, that in the last days God says, I will pour out My Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will have visions, and your old men will dream dreams. This is not something that went away after the apostolic leading with the twelve apostles and the thirteenth apostle. With, with No. He says, I'm going to pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Not just the apostles. He's going to pour out His Spirit upon Jew and Gentile. And what's He going to do? He's going to speak to us. He's going to prepare us. To do what? To prepare others. To whom much is given, much will be expected. Much will be required. I think about that all the time. I think about what it would be like if God never had called me. If I could just go to a church and just sit down and just listen every time. 
My prayer life would probably be nothing. My study time would probably be nothing. God's called me to this position. And in this position, I have nothing but time to seek Him. I don't care how much work I have to do, my full-time job, my full-time family. Jesus comes first and I must seek Him. Because if I don't, I have nothing to offer you. So God, according to His Word, has given me a dream. He gave it to me last Saturday while my dad was preaching about the Holy Sabbath day. He gave me a dream. So in my dream, I was standing on the shores of Lake Isabella, or at least it looked like Lake Isabella. And as I'm standing on the shores, there's a great multitude of people that are standing on the shores. Hundreds, if not thousands. And I remember walking right up next to the water and to where the sand meets, and I stood there, and I pulled out a trumpet. This is obviously a shofar up here. I pulled out a trumpet and I began to blow the trumpet multiple times. And as I continued to blow the trumpet, little by little, everybody, the music stopped, everybody was on the beach having a good time, you know, enjoying themselves, doing whatever they wanted to do. And I began to blow the trumpet. And little by little, they began to stop what they were doing. The music stopped, the game stopped, everything stopped, and they all took notice. And as I stood there at the shore... I began to cry out about Jesus' return. And I began to cry out about how Jesus was returning on the seventh trumpet. And just as you hear the trumpet today, you shall hear the trumpet then. And Jesus, our King and Messiah, shall return on the seventh trumpet. And I began to preach to this great multitude about the gospel of Christ and His return on the seventh trumpet. And preached our separation of God, separation from God because of our sins. And preached... Our, 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 even though we're separated from Him, preach our reconciliation and our return to Him through Jesus, through His death, through His burial, through His resurrection. As I'm preaching this, that great multitude left. They didn't want to hear it. And there was only three left of that entire multitude that wanted to hear it. And two of them claimed to be believers. And at one point in time, they said, yeah, I've already heard it. I don't need to hear it anymore. I've ran into that. And then one of them didn't know anything about Christ, and he sat there and listened. Praise the Lord. If you guys would please turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 33. So... As I was seeking the Lord, I'm like, man, God, where do you want me to go? Do you want me to go into the seventh trumpet spoken about in Revelation chapter 11? Do you want me to talk about your returning at the last trumpet according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Do you want me to go into here, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Thessalonians 5? Like, what are you wanting me to do? Are you wanting me to preach about your soon coming? Or, or what is it, God, that you want me to do? So I, I went out, I believe it was Thursday. I went out and I told Darlene, I said, hey, listen, I spent some time with them, played a couple games with the kids, and then went straight to the RV, my mobile prayer closet. And I don't know how many hours I was in there, but I went to go seek the Lord. And I remember going up in there and I said, God, I, I didn't come in here to write a sermon. I just came in here to seek you because I need word from you to prepare for what you have for me to give to your people. Amen. And so I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and then I got up and it was time to study. It was time to seek the Lord and I opened my Bible. And when my Bible opened, it was on Ezekiel 33 and I had a bunch of highlights and a bunch of notes there. So I ended up starting to read. And now I want to read it to you and this is why this is the foundation of the chapter that we're going through tonight. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say to them, when I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchman, if when he sees the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. What is God telling Israel through Ezekiel? Set up a watchman from your coasts. Set him up. One that's going to watch day and night. And if the watchman sees the sword of the Lord coming, blow the trumpet and warn the people. Notice, it's God's sword. It's God's judgment that's coming upon the land, of which the watchman is responsible for blowing that trumpet. To warn and to prepare the people of the land. Verse 4, Then whosoever hears... 
the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning. If the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that takes warning shall deliver his soul. So, if the watchman does his job, warns the land, warns God's people about this impending judgment, and the people do absolutely nothing, they sit on their hands, and the judgment come, their blood will be upon their own heads. They were warned and they did not take heed to the warning. He says in verse 6, But if the watchman see the sword come and doesn't blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his sin, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. If the watchman does not rise up and do his job, then all those that are destroyed because of the destruction that comes upon the land, the blood of all of those people shall be upon the watchman's hand. God rebukes Israel. If you study the book of Jeremiah, you study the book of Isaiah, you see the watchmen of those times, of those days. God says they're dumb dogs. Why? Because they don't even bark. They don't bark. What's the point of a dog if it doesn't bark? Have you ever had a dog bark and let you know somebody's outside? Yeah. Even though we said, man, shut up, stop barking, right? But how many of you have been thankful in the middle of the night your dog hears something that your ears didn't? And he starts barking. And he wakes you up. And you say, man, praise the Lord, right? The, the dog barked and got me up and prepared for whatever was about to come. God said of the watchmen of the day, they're a bunch of dumb dogs. They're, they're caught up on greediness. They're caught up on covetousness. They're caught up on their want and what they can do, how to feed and fill their soul. Instead of being what God has called them to be you know, as a watchman to warn and to prepare God's people for His coming. If a watchman doesn't do his job, if a pastor doesn't do his job, an elder, a bishop, a deacon, if you don't do your job, if you aren't being what God has called you to be according to His Word, and you don't preach the truth to God's people, their blood's going to be upon your hands. How can you say to such a thing? I don't. God's Word does. Continuing in Ezekiel 33, in verse 7, So thou, O son of man, I have set you a watchman to the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. Tonight's message is called, Warn Them From Me. So God says, Watchman, you're going to hear my word and you're going to warn my people. Verse 8, When I say to the wicked... O wicked man, you shall surely die if you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way that that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. What did he tell the watchman to do? Warn the wicked. Blow the trumpet and warn the wicked to turn from his wicked ways. Why? Because if not, he's going to die in his sin. In verse 9, Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, and he doesn't turn from it, he will die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Verse 10, Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel, thus ye speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we then live? Verse 11, Say to them, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? I love Ezekiel 33:11. When I hear people get excited about the wicked when they die in their wickedness, and they get pumped, I've heard pastors, oh man, praise the Lord that this person's out or this. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Praise God, we didn't die in our wickedness. Why? Because He was patient with us. He showed us great mercy and grace. God's not willing that anybody perish in their sin. He wants them to come to repentance according to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Right? 
I love that, that God says, you tell them from me, direct message from the Almighty, from God Most High, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from their wicked ways and live. And then he asks the question, why would you choose death? That's not my will for you. You want to know how I know that God loves us? You want to know how I know? Of course. But how I know that God loves us is because God does not bring forth destruction or judgment or wrath without warning. Even us. Have you ever just walked up and slapped the kid, your own child, in the back of the head for absolutely no reason? Okay, a couple people. Right? JoJo's household. But generally, what happens? Your children are warned. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't walk down the street. Don't hang out with those people. A warning has come. We talked about, right, Jonah. Everybody talks about Jonah in the world. What about Jonah and Nineveh? What did God do? God did not want to destroy Nineveh. So what did He do? He sent Jonah to do what? To preach righteousness. To preach against their sin. To blow the trumpet. To warn the land. You're going to be destroyed in 40 days because of your sin. But they came to repentance. Right? God warns. God warns first. That's how I know that God loves us, because God warns. Praise God that He warns. I love God and I love you all, but be certain, be certain, every one of you, that after tonight, after tonight's message, your blood will not be upon my hands. I've come here today to sound the alarm, to ring the bells, to blow the trumpet, and to warn you that if you continue to live in your wickedness and in your wicked way, you will die in your sins and face the wrath of God. And you shall be cast into the lake of fire. God is warning you because God loves you. I thank God for His warning. You may not appreciate it now, but praise God for it. You know, when Aaron was here, he's a 28-year-old man. That is just, whatever his life is, however he's been, whatever's gone on, he's 28 years old. He's had enough time to come to Christ. But God continues to warn him. And, and as he sat inside this church house today, I'm telling you, we, I warned him. I warned him. And I pleaded with him. And I reasoned with him. To do what? To repent. To forsake his wicked way and to come to Christ. Have faith in Jesus. Yeah. Speaking about the patience of God. Again, I love God. We love God. And I'm thankful personally for His warning. I've shared this story with some of you guys. Some of you have probably heard it. Some of you maybe haven't. But there was a time where my dad and I, and actually Brandon Gonzalez, who's now passed away, praise the Lord, he knew Jesus. Amen. He finished the race. But I remember walking the streets right here in East Bakersfield, right next to KMC. It's a pretty rough neighborhood. And I remember going out there and we were carrying the cross. And it was the very first time Brandon Gonzalez ever went out to the streets with us. And as he was sitting out there, right, he just he held his Bible to his chest because we got in some pretty uh, hairy situations. But I remember him sitting there and having his Bible up next to his chest. And we rolled up and there was, there was like 12 to 15 East Side Crips sitting on a corner right there. It might have been Flower or Orange Street, one of those two. A bunch of them. And as soon as we rolled up, on my t-shirt, obviously I have red now, but on the t-shirt it said, no Jesus, no peace, but the shirt was red. Obviously they're blue, so anything red in their territory or their community was openly disrespect, right? So, we walk up, my dad, myself, and Brandon, and they immediately surround us. They said, you boys are in the wrong neighborhood. And the first thing they said was, look at what we have here, boys. We got us some blood on our hands. And me, I was like, the blood of Jesus Christ? Well, they didn't like that. And as I sat there, we said, nope, I don't care. Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against me shall prosper, thus saith the Lord, right? So we just started, I don't care. Do you guys know about the gospel of Jesus Christ? We just started preaching and sharing Christ. Just preaching the Lord. Within five minutes, all of those men put their 40s down 
and stood in a circle in the middle of the street and began to cry out to God. God changed direction of what was happening. At one point, one of the men actually pulled out like, you know, you guys know you can go to Walmart and get those little $5 machetes. This guy pulled out a machete out of its sheath and put it in our face because he was going to stab us. And guess what? He went and put it away because God was dealing with every one of their hearts. But here's where the story takes an interesting turn. That day as we stood out there, we prayed together. Five of them were crying like girls. That's awesome. And we gave away five Bibles to these men who are lost in their sin and their gangbanging and their lifestyle. We left. They were all thankful at that time, right? They showed up. They wanted to kill us. They were leaving. They're thankful that we came. That same night, three of them were shot and killed on that corner. Three of them. I bet you they would never break down a church door to come hear the message about Christ. But God would break down their territory to go and send His people in to share His message with them. Because our God warns. Because our God is love, He warns. We went to their territory, their turf, and all the demonic things that are there. And we went in there with Jesus Christ and got to see grown men cry out to God from their place. Only God knows if those three men that were shot and killed that very same day that they heard the message of the Gospel, only God knows what they did with it. And if they died in their sin or they died saved, only God knows. But what? God brought us to them. They may have never come here, but God brought us to them. Do you see? God's patient. God's merciful and He's kind. And He's not willing that anybody perish, right? So He gave them opportunity. They'll never, ever, ever be able to stand before the throne of God and say, I've never heard and I didn't know. Nope, not true. Sent you a couple crazy white boys down into your turf to share Jesus with you. They'll never have an excuse why they didn't come to Christ or why they didn't know. They know. But God warns before judgment. God warns. As I shared, God's will and desire here and now is that all of you would heed and listen to the warning and truly repent and return to Him before it's too late. And just like in the dream, when all of those multitudes filled the beach, all of that multitude, some stayed, no, very few, a remnant stayed, the rest left. I'm very aware that there's going to be some here tonight, or maybe some here that are watching on YouTube or watching on Facebook, that they're going to hear the warning. They're going to hear the alarm. They're going to hear the trumpet. And they're not going to do anything with it. They're going to take the conviction that God is bringing upon their heart right now and they're going to do nothing with it. I want to be clear before I get into this that I do not know the day nor the hour of Christ's return. I have seen men and women fall in this area to think that they are smart enough, or have the, the wisdom to be able to say, this is the date that Jesus is coming on. I know this. So I, I don't know the day, I don't know the hour, and that's not what I'm here to do. I'm not blowing the trumpet to say, the Lord is coming on this day. No, because I would be wrong. I'd be a liar, and you could call me out on that. I've heard many do that. Throughout the millennia. Before 1000 AD. There was people calling out the day. We have false religions all over the place that are calling out the day. And even some of these false religions get to the point where they say, we need to stop making dates. Because they don't know and they won't know. One thing I know is sure though, is that He is coming. And He's coming on the seventh trumpet. And I wholeheartedly believe that I will see the Lord descending from heaven in the clouds in my lifetime, in my generation. And I live like it. Do I know the day or the hour? I don't. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 36 and Mark 13, 32, no man knows the day or the hour of the Lord's return. Not the Son, only the Father. So if anybody tells you, I know the day, or if I tell you, or my dad, or anybody stands in this pulpit and preaches that we know the day or the hour of the coming Lord, we're liars. And you can call us out. Because Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour. 
No man, only the Father. Now my trumpet warning is for what? The Lord is returning. The Lord is coming. Please turn your Bibles with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. You guys ready? Second Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen? Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth and its works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation, that means behavior and godliness? Knowing what? The earth is reserved for fire. The heavens are reserved for fire. The day of the Lord Christ is coming back. And when he comes back, he's going to burn up everything. Look outside right now. I was telling my dear sister in Christ, Natasha, I had called her and shared with her about the dream that God had given me. And I'm sitting there. And I went outside when I got here Friday before prayer, before our prayer meeting. And I started taking pictures right here from the bluffs. And I'm like, man, God has given me witness. He's given me testimony. To come up here and say, you guys see that? Do you guys smell that? You look up at the sun, you see the condition of the sun? Looks like it's all blood red. you got ashes floating everywhere. This is on the low end of what's actually going to happen when the Lord comes. He's going to burn up everything. Everything is reserved for fire. Look at this. I understand this is because of wildfire. I understand they're saying it's because of lightning strikes. I get it. But pay attention because this day is coming when everything you see shall be on fire. Everything will be burned up and melted to nothing. The heat is coming. Our God, the Scripture says in the book of Hebrews, is a consuming fire. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of our living God. He continues, Looking for the hasting under the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to His promise... Look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Verse 14, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of Him in peace without spot and blameless. What did Jesus command? Jesus speaks of His second coming, right? In Mark chapter 13, Matthew chapter 24. What does He tell His disciples to do regarding His return? Watch! Be ready! Pray! I can't stand here and give you the day when Jesus is returning, but what I can tell you is the same thing that Jesus told His disciples. is the same thing that He's telling us today. Watch and pray. Be ready, because He's coming back. He is coming. This is not a fairy tale. This is not some story that sounds good to, to, to make people afraid. No. Read the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 36. Matter of fact, let me, let me read this to you. Cody's sharing scare tactics, right? My church doesn't do that. We need to go to another church. My church doesn't, doesn't preach like that. My, my church, it's all about blessing and health and wealth and prosperity and all these... No, listen, you, if you're living in sin, you're going to die in your sin and you're going to get thrown in the lake of fire, period. What do you want to do, sugarcoat that? And tell you that all God wants to do is just bless you and give you everything that your heart's ever desired? That you need nothing more? than just a little Jesus cherry on top of your already perfect life? No. Your life is worthless. It has absolutely no meaning. If Jesus is not everything, you have nothing. Why? Because one day your job's going to go away. One day your money's going to be gone. One day your house is going to crumble to nothing. One day your car is going to get all rusty and old and fall apart. One day the only thing that shall remain is eternity. 
And wherever you spend eternity, your decision is made right here, right now. Say, Sharon, scare tactics with us. The earth is going to be burned of fire. Why are you telling people that? Because I must tell them the truth. What does a faithful servant do? Tells the truth. A faithful witness speaks the truth. A deceitful witness speaks lies. The proverb says, I have no interest in lying to you, even if it costs you ever coming back to this church. I want to tell you the truth so that you could truly be transformed and truly come back to Christ. I've got to poke you. I've got to stab you with the Word of God only so that you would be healed. I want you to be convicted. I want God to tear up your heart right now. I want Him to deal with you so that you would prepare yourself. Praise God that He's warning you because tomorrow you might die. You might die before the message is over. But God's loving you enough to tell you the truth and deal with you right now. Amen? Amen. Cody, it, it, what is this? It's all, always a scare tactic. Trust me, I think about this stuff all the time. I come to this house and I'm thinking like, man, God, it always seems like it's a hard message or it's this. It's not. It's not. It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. Jeremiah 36, this is what God says. It came to pass in the fourth year, verse 1 of, of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that his word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take a roll of a book, write therein all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel, against Judah, and, and against all the nations from the day I spake unto you, from the days of Josiah, even to this day. What did he just say? Take a pen, take a book, and write in it everything, all of my judgments that I'm going to bring upon all of these people, all of these nations, and write them in a book. What, what does the verse 3 say? That it may be that the house of Judah will hear of all the evil that I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Do you think God's using scare tactics? Tell them all that I'm going to do to them. Let them know. So that maybe they'll hear my judgment, they'll hear my wrath, and they'll turn from their wicked ways and return. That's what God's doing. I'm not a better preacher than God. There's no greater pastor, there's no greater shepherd than Jesus. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, it says in verse 7, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels. Verse 8, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that do not know God and that do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who is He coming back to destroy? Who is He coming back to pour out His wrath upon? Those who do not know Him. Those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. This should prick every one of you. Why? Because we all have family members who do not know Jesus. And God's going to destroy them where they stand. He's going to crush them to powder. I have family right now who have walked away from God, who don't believe in God, who aren't for God, who are for the devil. And God's going to judge them righteously. And he's going to burn them. He's going to burn them with fire. God's coming back to take vengeance upon all those who do not know Him. What did Jesus come to do? Jesus came to reveal the Father so that we could know Him. John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that you may know the Father and the One whom He has sent. What is eternal life? It's about relationship. It's about knowing God. That should affect you. Maybe it doesn't cause fear in your heart because you're ready for the Lord. But it should do something because you hear that and you're like, man, how many people do I work with? How many people are in my family who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel? It says in verse 9, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He shall come to be glorified in His saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Maybe you don't want to say anything to your family or to your friends whom you love because you're afraid of offending them. Or you're afraid to sharing God's Word with them because what if they leave you? What if they don't want to be around you anymore? I have a question for you. 
Who are you worried more about offending? Your family or God? We have churches and preachers and pastors and Christians who live a life of nothing but pleasing their fellow man, yet offending God in every step of it. I'm sure I was like that. I'm sure I've done that. Where, uh, yeah, you know what? I'm not going to say anything because I'm going to offend them, and if I offend them, then that may cut off. Offend them. Tell them the truth. Mark chapter 8. This is another one I don't have written down tonight. Listen to this. What if my family departs from me? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Because your enemies will be they of your own household. But you've got to count the cost. Is Jesus worth losing everything? I think so. He gave me His life. I'll give Him mine. In Mark chapter 8, listen to this. Verse 36. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for a soul? Verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. If you're ashamed of him now, if you're ashamed of his word, I see men and women of God who have followings get in front of live television and crumble. What do you think about same-sex marriage? Uh, 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 dance, 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 dance. It's an abomination. It's sin. It's wickedness. It's gross. Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 20. Oh, that's the Old Testament. Romans chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9. Sexual immorality, the sexually immoral shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But what? Because I don't want to lose my fan base. I don't want to lose my following. What do I do? I tiptoe around the Word of God and don't tell people the truth because I'm willing to offend God rather than to offend man. But there's a day coming when God will stand before you and offend you. There's going to be a day coming when you want to be ashamed of God, God's going to be ashamed of you. This is an adulterous and sinful and wicked generation. If you are ashamed of me and my words, I'm going to be ashamed of you. That's not what Cody says. That's what Jesus said. But we don't want to tell people the truth because we're afraid of what they'll do. So what? So what? You don't think God will take care of you? I was talking to my dear brother Anthony about preaching the gospel at work. Oh man, well what if this happens? What if you lose your job? What if people turn you in? What if you lose your income for sharing Christ? What if your boss says, not up in here, we ain't doing that? What are you going to do? Yes sir, I'll obey. No, skip that. God gave you the very breath in your lungs. You praise Him with it. You've been called to go out and share Christ with the whole world. In light of eternity, your boss has no authority. What does God say? You're ashamed of me, I'm ashamed of you. No, no, no. Separation of church and state. Read it. What is it about? It's about keeping the state out of the church, not keeping the church out of the state. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. What if you lose everything? Is God worthy? Will He not take care of you? How have you made it this far? And tell me, how many breaths did you breathe last night? You don't know. Daniel 5.23, it says, God is the God who holds our breath in His hands. The only reason I could breathe right now is because God ordained it, and He knows how many breaths that I'm going to take. Don't be ashamed of Him. If you love somebody, tell them the truth. Tell them what God says. Again, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, I remember I was speaking with my brother. We just got done studying the Scriptures, and I was out with my brother, and he's an atheist. And we're out in the ocean out in the water doing some body surfing and we're out there wave after wave taking it and I just read this that morning sitting out there in Morro Bay God is coming back in flaming fire and he's going to take vengeance on those who do not know him on those that do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ 
I said, bro, out in the water, it's just him and me. Please, don't reject God's love for you. Don't reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, please. And what did he do? He turned into a joke. Oh, you don't, re- you don't, you don't reject the, the ocean, the waves. You don't reject the waves. Went on to something else. Do they get irritated? I'm sure. Are they tired of hearing it? I'm sure. But I can tell you this much, they'll never be able to say, why didn't you say anything? You had this relationship, you had this life in Christ, and you never told me about it. You know what the worst thing, I think? My personal opinion is when you show up to a new job, and you're full of Jesus, and you start sharing Christ with people, and then your co-workers come up to a person who says, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. They say, you're a believer? You've been working there for 10 years and nobody knew that you loved Jesus? That's horrible. That's a shot to the heart. Jesus says, Matthew 5.16, no, 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 hey, hey, come on, man. No, Matthew 5.16, let your light so shine. It didn't say hide it. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. It can't. We have lights in this room. I have a light right here. What's the purpose of me throwing a rag over this and saying, I can't see, I can't see? Yeah, because you're covering what's supposed to be shining. If the light of Christ is in you, quit trying to hide it. Let it shine. What happens when you let your light shine in Christ? Men will see you. They'll see your good works. And what will they do? They'll glorify God. They'll come to want to know Him. Why? Because they want what you got. And what you have is available to them, and it's Jesus. Amen. Turn with me, please, to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. You guys there? Verse 27. For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You guys know with lightning how sporadic it is? It comes and bam. In and out. It's quick. Right? It's quick. And then what falls behind it? All the sound and everything, right? But the lightning came so fast you were not able to catch it quick enough, right? Because then you hear the sound like, oh man. For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even in the west, so shall even the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately, verse 29, after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heaven heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Amen. Amen. I've talked to you guys about it before. Out of the book of Revelation, I believe it's chapter 1, verse 7, when it talks about how when Jesus comes, every eye will see Him and they all shall wail because of Him. When somebody wails, it's like that inner cry, that cry from the belly, that groaning and moaning from the belly, like you're in complete distress. Why do you think that? And I've asked you this before, but why do you think that when every eye sees Him, there's going to be a wailing. I personally believe it's because there's going to be so many that are going to see Him come through the clouds and they weren't ready. They were living in sin. They didn't come out of whatever it was that they were living in. And now it was too late. They didn't heed the warning. There's no mulligans, there's no redos, retries, start overs. You don't get that. It's over. It's over. Revelation 22, 12, it actually says in, in Revelation chapter 22, it says it three times. Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. I'm coming quickly. I'm coming quickly. In Revelation 22, 12, it says, And behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give to every man according to what his work shall be. The first point that I'm trying to make is this. Christ 
is coming back. He's returning. Sometimes we stop at the Gospel, right? We hear the good news of our eternal salvation. We hear about what Jesus did on the cross through His death, His burial, His resurrection, right? And we stop right there. What about Christ's coming kingdom? What about His return? What about all the lost? What about all your family who don't know Jesus? Jesus, be very, very certain, church, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. And when He comes back, He's coming to judge the righteous and the unrighteous. That's what He's coming back to do. You just heard it in Revelation 22.12. Revelation 22.12 again. Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. He's coming back to be the judge. As I was sitting with Aaron today, I said, Bro, Jesus is not coming back. as the humble servant who, who girds himself with a towel in John, like John 13, and he washes his disciples' feet. This time, he's coming back as king. He's coming back as ruler. He's coming back to reign. And every knee, according to Philippians chapter 2, will bow. And every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That day is coming. He's coming back to judge. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, listen to this, church. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one of us may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether it's good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. What is he saying? Jesus is coming back. And He's coming with wrath and judgment and fire. So knowing the terror of God, we persuade men, we warn, we warn our family and our friends and our co-workers, acquaintances, complete strangers. We warn, we warn, we warn. Why? Because our God's a consuming fire. Again, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He's coming back with wrath, the wrath of the Lamb, so we warn. And why do we warn? Because we're separated from God if we're living in sin. Our sin, I want you this to be very clear, our sin separates us from God. It does. Turn your Bibles, please, to Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. You guys there? Okay. Isaiah 59 verse 2. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. Your sins have separated you between you and your God. So much so that He does not hear your prayer. Verse 3, Your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue has muttered perverseness, and none calls for justice, nor any pleads for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies, and they conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. Our sin according to the Word of God, has separated us from God to where He will not even hear our prayer. In Hebrews 7.26, it says that God is separate from sinners. He's holy. We're unholy. He's light. We're in the darkness. He's good. We're evil. Do you see the separation there? Light and darkness don't fellowship. Neither should good and evil. There's no fellowship there. In Psalm 7.10, it says that God's angry with the wicked every day. Psalm 5.5 says God hates all those who practice sin. Ezekiel 18.4 says the soul that sins shall surely die. In Romans 6.23, it says the wages of sin is death. In Romans 8.13, it says if you lived after the flesh, you will die. 
In Galatians chapter 6, turn that with me please. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Praise the Lord. Galatians 6 verse 7. Listen to this church. I want this to be very clear. Remember, I'm here to warn. I'm here to encourage you to return back to the Lord and to forsake your wicked ways. Why? Because our God's coming. But what if we don't see Him in our lifetime? You're still going to die. Hebrews 9.27 says, It's appointed unto men once to die, then the judgment. You're still going to stand before God. You're still going to give an account of your life. What am I saying? You need to be prepared at every moment. Why? Because you're never expecting to die. Galatians chapter 6, you guys there? Verse 7. Be not deceived. God's not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. He that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Don't be deceived, church. You're not going to mock God. You think that you're going to get away with what you're doing? I heard a wise saying in Home Depot one day as I was going to buy paint to work on a brother's house. This, old, this older man walked in and we were talking about Christ and he says, you want to know something, young man? He said, if God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for all their wickedness and He lets America go after all of its wickedness, he goes, shot him a good morning and apology. I said, that makes perfect sense. God just can't let sin go. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Because of its wickedness. You don't think our nation's wicked? California alone kills 122,000 plus or minus babies in the womb every year. Humongous pornography industry. LGBTQ and everything else that they promote, all the false religions, all of the bars and strip clubs that line up our streets, all these new pot shops that are going in, all the drugs and the people overdosing every day off fentanyl, heroin. You don't think that God sees it? All the adultery, all the fornication. God sees it all. God's going to judge this, this nation for its wickedness. Don't be deceived. You're not going to mock God. If you want to sow to the flesh, then you're going to of the flesh reap corruption. That's your end result. If you want to sow to the Spirit, you will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. That's the end result. What's, what's the things of the flesh? Remember, it's our sin that separates us from God. We're in a bad place. Why? Because we're separated. We have no covenant with God. Why? Because of our sin. Our sin has separated us from God. What is the works of the flesh? If we sow, right? He that sows to his flesh. What is the works of the flesh? In Galatians 5, right there in verse 19, the works of the flesh are manifest. They're evident. They're seen. Which are these? It's adultery. Are you living and practicing adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry? What about witchcraft? Halloween's coming up. And guess what? A bunch of Christians online and a bunch of Christians all over and a bunch of churches are going to open up their churches for something called Harvest Festival. And they're going to justify... Worshipping the devil so that people will come in. Separate what is holy and unholy. We do not celebrate that. Ephesians 5.11 Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose it. Amen. It's a day of darkness. It's the day of the dead. It's the day of the devil. You can't, church, you, can't, you, you can't Christianize it and call it good. It's not good. It's wicked and it's evil. It's witchcraft. It's witchcraft. Read horoscopes, witchcraft. Palm readers, witchcraft. Work of the flesh, right? That's going to offend some people. It doesn't matter. It's the truth. Come out of it. Come out of it. Give me a scripture where you could justify dressing up like a demon and going to a church house. Well, it's for the kids, so you're willing to lie to your kids then and lead them down the wrong path. Well, don't worry. Because if a parent you lead your children astray, then God's going to handle your business for it. You're responsible 
for where they're at and what they do. Train up a child in the way that they should go. When they get older, they won't depart from it. What are you training them up in? The things of the world are the things in God. You want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God, James 4.4. 4. What are you going to do? You're going to be held responsible for the condition of your child before they ever leave your home. You're going to be held responsible. Train them up in the ways of God, not in the ways of this world. Witchcraft. Hatred. you got hatred, bitterness, resentment in your heart. You need to repent. Variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I told you, as I told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If you are living or doing or practicing any of these things that are mentioned there, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. You will not. You will not. What about 1 Corinthians chapter 6? Turn there for me, please. Verse 9, another one of those that says, Do not be deceived. Same author, brother, or, uh, the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, it says, Don't you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, nor the effeminate. The word effeminate means men having female qualities. So you think that God's cool with, with men acting like they're women? He's not cool. Effeminate? Nope, you're not getting into the kingdom of heaven. God made you a man, you're a man. God made you a woman, you're a woman. Nor abusers of themselves of mankind. That word could be translated as homosexual. Nor thieves, nor covetous. You like to steal? Doesn't matter how big, how small, you steal something, you're a thief. What about the covetous? You want to covet what other people have? That's sin. Nor drunkards. Oh, well, I, I, I don't drink every day, just on the weekends. Listen, if you're a drunkard, you're not getting in. You're not getting in. Nor revelers. Those are verbal abusers. Nor extortioners. And shall inherit the kingdom of God. What about the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20? What about that? Have you ever worshipped or served any other God than Him? Make any graven images of anything in heaven or on earth or in the, in the water or anything? And worship, bow down to it, pray to it? You ever taken God's name in vain? You ever done that? That's sin. You defile God's holy Sabbath day? You don't keep it holy? What about the fifth commandment? You ever disobey your parents? What about stealing? What about murder? What about committing adultery? What about bearing false witness? Any of you liars out there? Liars inherit the fire. I'm giving you a head start, right? The book of Revelation, the very end. Liars will inherit the fire. There you go. You have an issue lying. What about coveting? You want what other people have. I want what my neighbor has. I want what this person has. That's coveting. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. And Jesus takes it to a whole other level. Why? Because He says, if you look at a woman and you lust after her, you committed adultery with her already in your heart. If you're angry with your brother without a cause, you've committed murder. Right? This is what Jesus said. In Revelation 21.8, listen to this. Revelation 21.8, The fearful, that's cowards, the unbelieving, the abominable murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, that's witchcraft, and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is a second death. Do you find yourself in any of those categories? Doesn't Paul say in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, to examine yourselves whether or not you're in the faith? Don't you know whether or not Christ is in you? Unless you be reprobates, unless you be condemned? Do you not know? What about a final one in Matthew chapter 7? Verse 22 through 23. Listen to this, church. This is by far, to me personally, one of the scariest verses I think I've ever had to deal with. I've ever had to study out and look into. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 22, it says this, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name? And in your name haven't we cast out devils? In your name done many wonderful works? Look at that. These people that Jesus is speaking of, they're casting out devils. They're doing wonderful works, right? They're prophesying. 
But then Jesus' response will be, I never knew you. I don't know you. Depart from me, you that make a practice of sin. What was it that separated them at the very end? What was it that caused Jesus to say, Depart from me, I didn't know you? It was that they never came out of their sin. Sin separates us from God. Right now, if you are living in sin, you're separated from Him and God's wrath awaits you. God's wrath awaits you. Sin separates us from God. The wrath of Almighty God shall be poured out on that great day upon the wicked. And I warn you now, if you're living in sin and He returns today, you're not getting into the kingdom of heaven. You can justify, just like I've justified. You can make every excuse why you've got to live in this place and do this or do that. I know grown men and grown women actively living in sin. And they've got every excuse in the book to say why it's okay. Don't worry about me. You don't have to justify yourself to me. You'll stand before God and you'll get that opportunity. But I can tell you that if you're living in that place, like I know people actively living in fornication right now, having sex, they're not married. Check it out. You ain't going to be able to justify that. Well, it's like common law in Oklahoma. We've been together for more than seven years and you know... Nope. Did you make a covenant between you and God? An oath was established? Is there a marriage or is there not? Because if there's not, it's not okay. And by the way, if you're marrying divorced people, that's also sin. Oh, don't say that. I didn't. Jesus did. I'm just repeating it. Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 19, Romans chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We can go down the list. Living in sin? You're not making it in, church. I have, to, I have to pry you off of whatever lifeboat that you're holding on to as if you living in sin are going to get into the kingdom. You're not. You're not going in. You're not getting there. You are separated from God as you sit in this pew, as you sit in this house. Righteousness will not... Unrighteousness will not inherit righteousness. I'm not here today, as I said at the very beginning. I know it got quiet in here. Praise God. I pray that God's dealing with every heart and God's convicting every soul right now. Amen. I'm not here today to preach peace and safety and prosperity. I'm not concerned about whether or not you have the nicest car or the nicest house or you have the best job or make the most money. I could care less. Why? Because I might preach a funeral one day and I ain't going to talk about none of that. Where were you at with Christ? How was your relationship with Him? Was it non-existent? Did you profess His name, but your heart is far from Him? I'm sounding the alarm. Christ is returning and the judgment of Almighty God is here and more is coming. If you're living in your sin and have not come to Christ, you shall be judged and cast into the lake of fire. Our sins, as I sat on that beach, like I said from the dream, our sins have separated us from God. But Christ restored us. Christ reconciled us to our Heavenly Father through His sacrifice. Listen, this is the best part of the whole message. Now, I get to, I get to plow through hearts. In the first part of the message, I get to plow your heart. I get to dig it up and we get to find out what's in there. And now I get to cultivate it. Now I get to plant. Now I get to water. Because we broke through the hard ground. We broke through whatever wall you came in here with. Whatever you've been living in. Whatever you've been dealing with. And now, here's the good part. You're hearing the trumpet. You're hearing the alarms. You're hearing the bells ring. And God's saying, turn from your wicked ways. And you're hearing that anybody that sins, they shall surely die. You hear that you're separated from God because of your wickedness. And just mentioning a few things that are called out in God's Word, you realize your condition and where you stand in light of eternity right now sitting in this house. And now I get to bring in Christ. Now I get to bring in Jesus. You're separated from God because of your sin, but Jesus brought you back. Jesus bridged the gap. Amen.
As, this is the best part of the message because grace is what we were given. Mercy is what we were given and we don't deserve it. God sent His Son down to this earth to die a death He didn't deserve for a people who want nothing to do with Him. He lays upon a cross. Before He got there, we've talked about it before, right? He was bruised and beaten. They whipped Him until His intestines should have fallen out His backside. They, they pushed a crown of thorns into His skull. They beat Him in the head with a rod. They slapped Him in His mouth and punched Him in His face. They openly spit on Him and disrespected Him. Then they made Him carry His own cross to a place called Golgotha. Or some people say Calvary. He carries His own cross. They lay Him down and they stretch Him out and they nail Him to His cross. And then they lift Him up for all to see. They put two nails, one in each hand. They set His feet up at a 45 degree angle and give Him one point with one nail to be able to lift up off of to take a gasp of air. And He lays there. And God pours out all of His judgment, all of His wrath, all of His anger that was meant for you and meant for me all upon Jesus. And Jesus took the weight of our sin. He took the shame of our sin. How so? Because He laid there naked. He didn't have that little diaper or cloth thing on. No, He was completely exposed laying upon that cross. He took our sin, He took our shame, and He took our guilt. And God crushed Him. We broke the law. Jesus paid the penalty. God crushed him. You read verses like Isaiah 53, 10, and it says it pleased Yahweh to crush him when he would make his soul an offering for sin. Jesus was the sacrificial lamb. He is the sacrificial lamb. When John the Baptist sees him for the very first time in John chapter 1, verse 29, he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He's the Lamb that God would put to death because of me and because of you. You will never be able to escape the fact that it was your sin and my sin that put Him there. The Bible says in Romans chapter 4, He was delivered for our offenses and He was raised again for our justification. It was because of me. It was because of all of my wrongdoings. It was because of all of your wrongdoings Jesus did there. Now, Jesus is laying there. Some of you remember some of the things that He said as He was taking His last breaths. He laid on that cross for six hours. Six hours he laid on the cross. They nailed him to it at the third hour. They took, he was dead in the ninth. He laid upon the cross for six hours for me and for you as they spit on him, cursed him, mocked him. One of the last things he says is, It is finished. What's finished? The payment, the cost of our sin debt, it was finished at the cross. And when Jesus took His last breath, do any of you remember what was torn from top to bottom? The veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Why top to bottom? Because it was God who tore the veil. What was behind that veil? The Holy of Holies where God dwelt, where God would speak with man, where a high priest one time a year from the tribe of Levi would go and sacrifice for his sins and for the people's sins once a year. And some of them would even die in the very near presence of Almighty God. But God was in there in the Holy of Holies and He was separated from all of His people by that veil. Why? Because we were sinful and He's not. Because He's good and we're not. So when Jesus took His final breath upon that cross and He said it was finished and the, and the rocks shake and the, and, the, and the atmosphere was dark, 
It's like the sun disappeared, that veil was torn from top to bottom. Now there was a way for us to enter into the Holy of Holies through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. No longer separated because of our wickedness. Why? Because somebody else paid. Complete access brought near to the very near presence of God. Now I have boldness to enter into the holiest of all by the blood of Jesus. So you're separated. Christ is coming back. Christ has made a way for you. Don't reject His love. Don't reject His kindness. God's not willing that you perish. He doesn't want you to die in your sin. He wants to give you everlasting life. And this message may sound elementary to you, but there's a lot of people who don't know this. I've even heard some say, I'm just tired of every single message. You've got to bring the gospel to you because there's no better message than the gospel. What did Paul say? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing. You think it's foolish? You're perishing, it's evident. But to us that are saved, it's the power of God unto salvation. Why was Paul not, not ashamed of the gospel in Romans 1.16? Because it was the power of God to salvation to all who believe. It was the power of God to make somebody who's dead in their sin and bring them to life. To make somebody who's lost and make them found. It's the power of God. It's the power of God. One of my favorites... I'm almost done here, guys. One of my favorites in Romans 5, 8 through 9. See, today when I was sitting with Aaron, the guy who came in I shared with you at the beginning, when I was sitting here with Aaron, he could not wrap his mind around because Aaron knows what he's done. Aaron knows his past. Aaron knows the sins that he's committed against God. So Aaron sits back and contemplates the gospel. The gospel being the good news of our eternal salvation, through Jesus Christ, His death on the cross, His burial, and His resurrection. That's the gospel. Right? According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1-10. through 10. Go read it sometime. But he sets back and says, Why? What good reason did he have? Nobody does that. Nobody's going to die for an evil person. What was the motive? I want to know because... I look at the gospel, and I, I can't accept that he would do that for me. It just doesn't, it does, sounds too good to be true. You bet it does. But what was the motive? Love. Love. Did you miss that in John 3, 16? For God so loved the world, he gave his own son. Or Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his love that while you were still sinners, Christ died for you. While you were still sinners, Christ died for you. And much more now, verse 9, being justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. What is Jesus saving me from? He's saving me from my sin debt, and He's saving me from the coming wrath of the Father. That's what He's saving me from. That's what He's saving anybody from that repents and, and turns from their wicked ways and comes to Christ. And by faith believes in His Gospel. Right? In John 8, 36, it says, Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Do you know what he's talking about? What freedom he's talking about? That freedom is from the bondage of sin, from the power of sin, from the stronghold of sin. Jesus came, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, to destroy the works of the devil. He took away the power. He holds the keys of hell and the grave. Matthew 28, he starts off by saying, What all authority, all power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. What does he then say? Go preach the gospel. Go make disciples. Right? Something beautiful I was reading in Luke chapter 6, verse 35. It says that God is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. God is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. Do I believe that Jesus is coming? Yes. Do I know when? No. Do I want to live a lifestyle as if He could show up in 30 seconds? Yes. I want to be ready for Him at every moment. I want to be watching and praying that when He comes, He, does, he doesn't show up on me and I'm ashamed. Right. I, want to, when he sh I want to be standing there in confidence saying, God, I've been waiting for you. And personally, I'm thankful that He hasn't showed up yet. Why? 
because I have a bunch of family members who don't know him. I have a bunch of friends who don't know him. And I have a bunch of coworkers that don't know him. Just as God doesn't want them to die in their sins, neither do I. Why? Because I have the heart of Christ. I want them to be saved. I want them to know. My encouragement to you all today is to repent. If you're living in sin, if you're practicing sin, repent. Turn. Change your heart. Change your mind. Turn from your wicked ways. Call upon Jesus Christ to save you. Romans 10.13 says what? Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe in His gospel and you shall be saved. The judgment of the Lord is upon the land. Pay attention. See what's going on outside. God Most High desires all to be saved. My encouragement to you is to come to Him and not to waste another second because 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1-2 through 2 says today's the day of salvation. Tomorrow's not even promised. Again, you may have sat here during this message and you heard about the return of the Lord and how we're separated from God because of our sin and how Jesus reconciled us to the Father and brought it all back in and saved us. Praise God. A lot of people don't know that. Right? A lot of people haven't accepted that. There's a lot of people who know that and have not come to believe that. Another story about Aaron when he was here today. He asked me for five bucks. But he wanted to do something for it. No, I'll give you five bucks. Well, will you buy my sunglasses off me? No, I don't want your sunglasses. Will you let me take out the trash or sweep or do it? I said, no, I'll just give you five bucks. Nah, man, I, 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 nah, I don't want it then, man. I got to be able to do something. I said, so what are you going to do with salvation? What are you going to do with the gift of eternal life? Because the moment that you begin to work for something or to pay for something, it's because you're paying off of a debt. Your debt's already been paid, so what are you offering God when He offers you a free gift? If you can't take five bucks, you ain't going to take eternity and salvation through Jesus Christ either. You're going to think, and that's a problem with most people, is they think that they have to go out and work for it. You can't. There's nothing that you could do that could save you, that could take away your debt. The only one who could do something about it is Jesus Christ, and He already did. And He's called you to put your faith in Him. You want to be righteous? Put your faith in Christ. You want to put to death the deeds of the flesh? Read Romans 8.13. It's through God's Spirit. It's not through your flesh. John 6.63, the flesh profits nothing. The Spirit is profitable for all things. You need Christ. Accept it. Believe in Him. So church, God loves you, so He warns you. God loves you, so He warns you. Can I ask any of you, so here's the big question now. Are there any of you today that God is not only convicted, but God is drawing you to Himself? You see your need for Christ because you know what's coming upon the land. And if He was to appear right now, you'd be in some pretty big trouble. Why? Because you've been playing church. God's kind and merciful to all those who call upon Him. 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He calls all men everywhere to repent. Acts 3, 26, He sent Jesus to bless you in turning away every one of you from your sins. 2 Timothy 2.9, if you name the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. So on and so on and so on. If you're truly in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17, you're a new creature. The old man is gone. Look, the new man, is, new man has come. It's Christ. It's Jesus. We need Jesus. Are there anybody that's here tonight that is not ready for Him? That if He comes, He's going to tell you, depart from me. I never knew you that made a practice of sin. My encouragement to you is to cry out to God to repent. Beg Him for mercy. Beg Him for forgiveness. He'll give it to you. And believe in His Son, Jesus the Christ. Believe in His Gospel. Believe that He went to the cross for you. Believe that He was buried. Believe that He was risen from the grave. And you shall be saved. Amen.